I, it's amazing. Uh, I think uh, we installed that sculpture in 1999, so it's been 12 years. And uh, I, knew, I knew when I first, I, uh, I did not only the sculpture, but I did all the foundry work. I actually did the original patina and the finish work. A lot of times I try to patina in such a way where it will age gracefully. Uh, and uh, I like to see how my sculptures age. And, uh, and, and, you know, I would see it during different World Series events. And, and it really wasn't that bad. You know, some of the ground was a, a little bit, um, uh, there were some water damage a little bit on the ground because, I mean, the ground is so rough that, you know, there'd be water puddles. And there was some gum, a little bit of gum, but I was able to take a torch and, and burn that off. So, uh, but it really, uh, the surface was kind of nice. So this it's original condition when it left my studio. The process I used here was I, uh, there's a, I used an exterior lacquer sealer that's meant for bronze sculptures. And I would actually take it, it comes in a gallon form, and I would take it to a, um, a company that could actually put it into a, a spray can, you know, like a little paint sprayer can. And I actually got a, a flattening agent from the factory, and I had them also put that into the spray can. Uh, when, I originally, when I originally patinaed it, which is putting the color on the piece, and I, and I sealed the surface, uh, I did that at my studio, and I mixed up almost like a, a, a big, more of an industrial sprayer. And I kind of remembered that at that time, well, with all my sculptures, I, I really don't want them to be, appear too shiny, especially if they're figurative pieces. Because it, if I'm trying to sculpt a human being, I want to try to have the sheen similar to a human being's sheen. Uh, I feel if it's too shiny, it will take away and make, him, make my figurative sculptures less human. So I tried to uh, uh, get the same lacquer that I used uh, back in 1999 and I had it flattened to where I liked it. And I had been out at this uh, site for the last, uh, uh, well, especially this last week, and just restoring the piece and looking at it all over and, and respraying it. I had to wash the piece, wash all the dirt, and, uh, and blow any kind of sediments off. Uh, there was no, uh, uh, this, the pieces were in really, really nice shape, except for, the, I guess, the gum and the dirt. Then what I would do is I would, once that was all cleaned, uh, I would take, uh, well actually what I did do this time is I drilled a few more holes in the dirt. And they're just little teeny holes that the water could drain. Because it, when I originally sculpted that dirt, I, uh, I basically took a, a, I used water-based clay, which is almost like mud. And, uh, and I just made this big, big grounds made out of clay. And then I would take, um, uh, and it was still wet clay. And I would take dried clay and crush it up with a hammer and throw it on all there so it looked like dirt. And then, uh, then I would take, uh, when, before I, uh, when I had the sculpt of the shoes and I, and I created them in, in wax, which is part of the process, I would take a, a sculpture of one, one of the shoes, and I'd, or several of them actually, and I'd push it in there and make it look, kind of look as violent as I could make it. And I really didn't care about what, to, I liked it having lots of depressions because I thought it looked more real and natural. Uh, but what happened over the years is those depressions were basically little water uh, puddles, little uh, bird baths. And uh, so I did put some holes in there which would help uh, drain some of that water off. But there's still enough for the birds, don't, don't worry about that. I don't know if I would do it that same way now. But I actually thought, well, I'm going to cast all of this myself, you know, with people helping me. And the casting process is you, 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 when, it, when it's made into bronze from the clay, you divide the clay up in many different pieces. And then you, on the, and in those pieces, you create a bronze image of the clay. And then you have to weld all those pieces together. And I remember this sculpture, I bet you there were maybe 60 or 70 pieces that I had to weld together and welding means I would take a, a welder called a, a TIG welder, which is a very precise welder. And I would take the same type of bronze in a welding rod, and so I had to weld upside down and backwards and forwards. And uh, just the foundry 
part took several months. But creating this uh, piece uh, just in clay, you know, the original sculpture took about a year. So it took over a year to do the whole work from start to finish. I have a, a philosophy in a way that I really never title my sculptures. I have a hard time because it almost seems like it's superficial. Because, you know, I'm working in this visual language of what, how, how do I want this to look? How do I want this to feel? And I really don't want to apply a word to it. What, what the, best, the best way to have that happen is for others who see this piece to, uh, to name it. And the Road to Omaha came, this was, this was a sculpture based and celebrating the 50th anniversary of the College World Series in Omaha. And uh, I know a lot of the people who really support the College World Series at that time, l while looking at the sculpture, said, you know, this really, uh, this whole thing, besides of all the, all the emotions that you put into this piece, you're really describing the road you know, really the road to Omaha. And I think that's how it came about. The, the road to Omaha is really based on, and that title is based on all the work, all the long road it takes for a team to finally get to Omaha, to finally be able to celebrate like this. I mean, there were winners before they even arrived to Omaha. And to have them come to Omaha, that's just a whole journey of celebration. It's really the whole inspiration came from the players. I wanted this sculpture to really be from the player's point of view. And I knew that this sculpture originally was gonna be out in front of the stadium, right where the players, when they would just come into Omaha, just probably see the stadium from the interstate, they were gonna come into Omaha on a bus, and I wanted the first thing that they'd see is, oh, look it. And I really wanted them to say, hey, look, at someone did a sculpture of us. That's what I really wanted. And so I really wanted it to be all the, the guts and the glory and the teamwork and the talent about them. And that was my, all the way through this, was my total inspiration. You know, once I got over the, uh, the hump of how much work it was, and even restoring this sculpture, you know, it's several days and I would uh, relacquer it, but I would have to hand work every inch of that surface. So basically I was maybe 10 inches away from every square inch of that surface. And so I was filled with all those type of memories of the amount of the complexities of how to, you know, how to try to make it look natural, how to, how to, to make the hands look like they were really pushing against the skin. Uh, the balance was a little bit off balance and had to be carried by one of the players. Um, all of those memories came back uh, about the amount of effort it was just to create the piece. But then, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm looking at, you know, where I signed it and why I signed it the way I signed the piece. It, it's, a, it's a small signature, but I wanted the piece to speak for itself. I'm very proud of this piece. And, you know, I struggle. You go, well, do I put my name really large on there? I wanted it right in front. I put it by home plate. But I wanted the piece to be more than just the artist. Well, sometimes I would spy on a little bit. I would, uh, you know, I'd, my wife really lo loves going to the games, and my daughter, I don't know how many hats I have, but, you know, and it, it, you know, it is something, because, you know, when, when the players all come into town, and the fans all come into town, you know, it, I'm sure everybody has noticed how it's almost an electricity where all the people in Omaha, the visitors, they're all rooting for all the teams. You know, we want all the teams to, to, uh, to, you know, to win and to succeed. And, and I would, uh, you know, right during the opening days of the College World Series, I would go down there with my wife. And I didn't really want, I mean, I, I was very proud if they knew that I was uh, the artist, then I would love to talk to them. But I'd rather for me, uh, just watching people's reactions. And they really didn't know who the artist was or anything about the artist. Or even if it was done, uh, you know, I'm based in Omaha, and uh, people probably don't really have an understanding of, you know, where the sculpture originally came from. But 
but just how they reacted and they really, you know, like, hey, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's about our team. And sometimes I think I'd see little kids maybe sneak up players sometimes, you know, on the top. One of the, one of the players, I cannot remember the, the name of the team, but they would sneak up and put their hat on, on, on the one sculpture. And, um, and I, it, it did give a lot of, those are the type of comments that influenced me the most. Because it was almost like, hey, you know, I better just uh, move away. You know, and I, it really sends you home because when you do a work of art, you think, well, it's something that, you know, I've tried to create and then sweated over and toiled over. And like I just talked to you about all the work it took. None of that matters. You know, it matters to me. But what really matters is, you know, you have the, these kids, they want to stand and get their picture taken by this sculpture. They want to be outside by this sculpture. Even when the College World Series wasn't in Omaha, when it, when it, when it, was, when it was gone people would come in off the interstate as a stop and want to get their picture taken. Uh, they would come to, into Omaha to get their picture taken by this sculpture. And, you know, I can't tell you what that means to me. I mean, that's, that is the greatest compliment I could ever have about my work. Well, you never know uh, about your work. Um, and you do know that you separate yourself from it. And you have to look at it. It takes, takes about a year or two sometimes, almost as a viewer. You know, any artist, uh, when they see the work that they've done a long time ago and it's no longer in their possession, you know, they have to look at it as a viewer. And I do remember the first time we uh, put it up uh, down at Rosenblatt Stadium. There was a crane and they delivered it. It, 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 and you know, it's kind of uh, neat because even when they removed it from there, you know, when it was on a truck, it brought back memories of when it was first, first arrived. Just as when it's gonna first arrive at, the, at, uh, at uh, TD Ameritrade Park, that's gonna be really something. But I remember there were people, uh, this was uh, I think about a, a few days before the opening of the College World Series back in 1999. And there were a lot of fans around. And it came off the truck and they already had the holes drilled and they were filling up, uh, putting the anchors in and ready to connect it to its base. And I remember, you know, and I was always, I was just so stressed, you know, oh, I hope nothing goes wrong and I hope the crane, but I had such great people doing it. But um, when they set it down, when they just set it down on the base and when the straps uh, relaxed off the crane, it was interesting because all these fans started clapping. I mean, and they were all clapping that that piece was there. And obviously I didn't know at the time, you know, how the fans would, you know, how it would grow and be a part of the, so much a part of their lives. But even at that point, I still remember how the fans just celebrated that it was there. That was really something. Can you talk a little bit about how you achieved? Well, that was a lot of, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, ways I wanted, I wanted since they were uniforms, I wanted them to look as authentic as I could. And I said, well, how do I do that? You know, it'd, it'd be impossible to uh, carve a perfect circle for a button or, um, you know, even stitching or things like that. So what I would do is I would make a series of stamps and tools, basically. I'd make a round, almost like a pizza cutter. But I would have that machined with little dips in it, so it would make stitching. And uh, the stamps, I would make another kind of a negative, almost a, a stamp that you could push to make the buttons. And then I would carve away from it so the buttons looked like they were pushed inside. Um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the individual letters, I, uh, I noticed that when I was working on the piece, it reminded me again how I did that. Because every, every sculpture is kind of a challenge and unique. I actually would take a tar paper and I would because it was a stable stuff, I could cut the letters out. And then I would just dip this tar paper in wax, molten wax, and let it stick to each other. So it was, uh, and that's how I kind of made every one of those individual letters too. So gosh. And even this, the sweatbands, the sweatbands, since I used uh, water-based clay, that's the kind of clay I like to sculpt with. Many artists use oil-based clay, it never dries. Um, but water-based clay, think of it as mud in your backyard almost like clay pots and uh, you can have it very wet and if it's not wet enough you can spray water on it and get it really wet 
And so even the, the sweatbands, I would take a, 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 a dry, I think I, I used maybe like a bamboo brush, like a wisp brush, like a wisp broom kind of brush. And I would sit there and I would get, the, get that really wet and I would poke at it until I thought it looked enough like a, a sweatband. I really didn't know, I go, how in the world am I gonna, I want their mouths open, but then where do you stop? You know, I didn't want to show, I'm not sure what that's called. It's not the tonsils, it's the um and gloom louder or whatever that is, a little punching bag. I didn't want to show, I didn't necessarily want to try to show everything, a single thing about the mouth. But I wanted the teeth uh, to look right, so uh, I went to my dentist and he said, well, why don't you go get some dentures? And so I I'd got dentures and I actually were able to look at those and see you know, how that looks. And almost coming from a dental point of view, I thought I was almost a dentist cleaning teeth when I was making those. And even the tongue and the inside of the cheeks. When you opened up your mouth, you know, the inside of your cheek, you know, would press against your, your teeth. And I wanted that to kind of feel as natural as I could. And uh, gosh, when I'm looking at it now, look at all this cheek. I basically, it was basically like a, a dentist. Uh, and that's how I, I kind of approached it. You know, I would have to just make a, make, I actually make individual teeth sometimes, or not all of it, but the outside edges. No cavities, I don't think. Is there a... uh, at the time, some of the uniforms were shorter. And I didn't want to try, I tried not to limit it to a certain era necessarily. So I also made them a little bit baggier than normal. And now I think some of the newer uniforms are even more baggy because over time, the different styles fluctuate. Well, there's one, a real good friend of mine's son passed away. Um, and uh, and he, this, this young man was uh, in high school, he, and he loved baseball. And, uh, and he was very talented. And he passed away, and it really, um, I mean, it crushed his father. I mean, how, how would you feel if your son passed away? I mean, you're left with, with nothing. I mean, your world just collapses. And uh, so I thought, you know, I'm going to surprise him. I didn't tell him, but I put the number 38 on the very top player, you know, for that reason. And uh, and then when he saw it, I I I, I know he was uh, very emotional about it. But you know, I wanted to give him his space and just know that you know, you know, at least I cared about about him, how much I really cared about him and his family. So. Well, I really tried to make it that way. That's why I use all the, the different lacquers, the different sheens to the lacquers to restore this piece. Um, most sculptures are very shiny, bronzes. And that's because one of the best coatings you can have is, is just basically a waxed coating. And you would take uh, paste wax, believe it or not, almost like the paste wax you use on your floor. And you would brush it on the sculpture. And then you take a torch, believe it or not, and you, and you pass over the wax, and it actually ignites whatever, if there's too much wax on it, it will burn it. And then after that's done, then you burnish the surface with a rag and really bring out the luster of the bronze. And I thought, well, I could go that route, but then the sculpture is gonna be very shiny. And, it, and I've always loved the way, another great thing about this piece is, is how it was always photographed. And it always seemed like it photographed well. You know, you'd see it in the paper or people's pictures, and it always seemed like it, it photographed well. And I didn't want to ruin that. I wanted to try to make it where um, it had some luster to it. But if I made it too shiny, the light would reflect and, ref and refract off of it, and it just went, it would lose its humanness. And I really wanted to uh, not make it like a traditional bronze sculpture that would actually be, in a lot of ways, easier to to restore. So I just tried to use a series of different sheens of lacquer uh, that is meant for bronze. Um, and, and even this too, even after restoring this, it, it will age gracefully, just like the new, studium, uh, uh, the new stadium will age gracefully. So, uh, uh, but, but I, I want it to feel like it's still as human as it always was. Now, do you want to I've never had, and I don't know or maybe I've come after it rains. But I, I, bir birds do not seem to want to poop on my sculptures. And, uh, and I've never had a sculpture vandalized. I've never had a, anything like that. Uh, uh, 
so far, and I've done pieces all over the country. It's just, uh, it is strange. <laughs> you know, they, well, they, they, they probably feel so sorry for the work, you know. That must be it. You know, they want to avoid that one. Oh, there's been so many people that helped me with it throughout the years in creating the piece originally. You know, you think about them uh, and, and, and all the effort it took. I would think about that, but I've always been kind of a forward-thinking, try to be a forward-thinking person. I don't really want to th live in the past or think about the past. And what I'm really excited about, and I know this isn't answering that question, but... Uh, is is once it's placed and how the fans uh, the, all the excitement and the electricity that's going to buzz around Omaha you know in June and just just how they treat it and and it'll be interesting to see that the college World series is such such an important part of Omaha and this is kind of a, a new life to the series and but the, but the traditions and the players are still the most important thing. And that's why I think this sculpture still carries through because it really shows that. And I don't know, I, I always think, of, I always look forward to looking at that and maybe coming down to the new stadium and spying on the people that walk around the piece and, and just the whole magnificent atmosphere that, that's around Omaha at that time. So I'm thinking about, the, I'm thinking about next June not last June or, the, or 10 years ago when I first did the piece. <laughs>